Thank you very much, uh, Venda. Um, and thank you very much for having me here at this important uh, event. I want to start being quite positive, actually, because I feel like we have made some advances over the last 12 months in terms of pushing a decolonizing agenda and generating a movement against racism, particularly in education. You know, last year our union had a, 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 a decolonizing education conference, but certainly over the past six months, and it, it was certainly well attended, and, and there is a desire to desire to push that then, but certainly over the six months, uh, we've felt there has been an upsurge in uh, a, a want to push this further in our classrooms, and that has been very much driven uh, by the ups the uprisings that have happened over over the summer the, the following the brutal murder of George Floyd and the, and the toss top toppling uh, of Col Colston but we've seen huge petitions hundreds of thousands of people signed a petition to have the, the truth taught on Britain's colonial past we've uh, been seeing it in the national press uh, members have been getting published uh, to, to raise this demand nationally and we've also launched our anti-racist framework which has been um, which has been taken up uh, greatly but what makes me feel more than anything like we've been making some advances over the past six months is that there has been a very definite kickback from the British state in regards to in regards to this it's almost as if Britain does not want to confront its racist past because then it might have to confront its racist present and it's so we, we, but we were starting from a very low base historically uh, Britain has not taught uh, the truth on Britain's colonial history. Um, it, you know, the toppling of Colston taught many people more about slavery than, than the British education system ever, ever did. And it's something that we should all know about, isn't it? We should all know about the crimes of Colston and uh, the crimes of the Royal Africa Company and, 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 and the history of slavery in this country. But it's not also the history of slavery and, and Britain's colonialism we need to, to learn about. Black people generally are just not celebrated in education. Uh, and there has been um, a, a definite mood to shift that. And we have certainly made some advances but the kickback that we are certainly feeling and seeing from 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 not just the the the, the British state but also uh, others it, it, it is manifesting because of this fear uh, 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 of 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 what could be in education you know so uh, we we the more we've pushed the, the decolonizing agenda, we've seen a, a group of educationalists who uh, certainly like uh, neoliberalism in education uh, come together and form a, a group called Don't Divide Us. And, and they, their, their, their main aim is to stop uh, the teaching of the truth on, on Britain's, Britain's history. But in terms of the British state, you know, we've uh, see, seen the, the the recent spy cops bill go through, uh, which will definitely uh, impact on us, us trade unionists. In fact, it was five years ago this weekend, uh, we went to Calais, stand up to racism. And I remember a uh, special branch quizzing Wayman what we were, what we were, what we were doing there. But we've also seen in terms of education, uh, this new RSE uh, guidance come up, you know, no teaching on, on anti-capitalism uh, and also this idea that uh, we can't teach victim narratives is how it's framed in terms of RSC. So, you know, the battle is far from won. In fact, we're nowhere near winning it yet, but they are scared of what could be achieved. Um, so it's really up to us to continue to force that change, isn't it? And, and, and Black History Month is a good time to be doing that. Uh, and we've seen lots of uh, schools certainly celebrate it uh, effectively. But what we really need to be doing is shifting away from this idea that we just teach about Black History in the month of October and turn it into something that we teach all year round. But fundamentally, as an educationalist and anti-racist, if you are an anti-racist in education, we need take, to take control of our education settings. I think what's endeared me most over the past six months is when I've been going to districts and branches and talk, discussing decolonizing education or anti-racism in education or the anti-racist framework is that teachers have been getting saying you know you know we've got together as a department team and we are taking control we are going through our literature we are uh, going through our syllabus and making sure you know black people are celebrated all year round I, you know it was in tower hamlets 
and a teacher there was telling me how they, uh, before they're teaching algebra, they're going to do a, a, a period of work on how algebra comes from Arabia. It's like got Arabic roots, and it's just to shift this sort of hetch like Eurocentric uh, norm that exists in education. But beyond that, we have to fundamentally support every shift, uh, every every movement a, 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 a against racism, including stand up to racism, and we can't sort of come here and discuss uh, what's happening in education without without talking about sort of COVID-19 and the impact that is having on, on, on black communities. And that, the, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is, we should expect this racist, uh, this racist, um, this push, this racist push from the British state to just get further and more and more aggressive, more and more aggressive because as this crisis deepens, uh, the, the British state will look for scapegoats and it will not be the failure of the British state uh, that is, uh, her, her, his will have hurt the economy. They will look to blame migrants, refugees. So we need to certainly resist. So continue, please, to support uh, a movement to decolonize education and support the wider movement against racism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. There is so much to be excited about, especially with what's happening in schools. I think uh, teachers and educators are really quite, um, you know, um, excited and rejuvenated uh, to go back into schools. And Black History Month um, this year seems very, very different to me, um, being an educator myself. It feels like everyone is taking it so much more uh, seriously. And uh, there's a real endeavor in schools to make that a more meaningful activity. And you're absolutely right. And it's only, I think the pushback from the state is only a testament to you know, how successful all that is uh, and um, how widespread that is in, in schools and on behalf of educators as well. Thank you for starting us off, uh, Daniel. We are going to move on to our uh, second speaker, uh, Victoria Showin Me. Uh, Victoria is a UCU, um, NEC, and Black Members Committee Chair. Um, when you're ready, Victoria, you have six minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Venda. So as uh, Venda has just said, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Just to clarify, so I'm I'm on I'm I'm with UCU. I'm an academic at UCL. Now with UCU, I stand on the NEC, I'm a, and I'm also I chair the Black Member Standing Committee, and I and I'm vice chair of the Higher Education Committee, along with being chair of the Equalities Committee. So just so you can see that there's all different ones there. Um, and as I said, I'm based at UCL and uh, there's a lot of work which has been done and we've taken the lead on eugenics and what ha what's happening with eugenics and how that in itself is showing its ugly self regarding um, the, the, the fight against racism. So what do I want to talk about? I mean, I'm, I'm a strong feminist. So my work is really around gender and the voices of black women and uh, black girls and what black girls in school and, and black women in the university and, and out in the workplace. I've done some work with um, NEU um, I did the mapping of um, the motions, the motions which get presented and passed through the, uh, the Black Teachers Conference and what happens there. And I did a mapping and a report on that, which I'm sure that um, some of the people around the table here would have seen. Um, so um, what, what, what do I have to, con what can I contribute to this discussion? I think the most important thing is that we've had some really big things happening this year. Um, I am a positive, I am a very much an optimist, but I, I, I don't feel so optimistic um, in many ways. We, we, we started off the year, with, with the last couple of years, we've had Me Too and the Me Too, hashtag Me Too and what that started off with. And of course that started off with black women actually talking about the fact, what about us? And how do we get involved in the conversation regarding um, being women and also facing sexual violence, sexual abuse, etc. As we moved into that, you then get in, you then get uh, pushed to one side because white women in the media take on fraud and they think this is a good idea. We, we need to get into that as well. 
so the the origination the originators of black of black women for um the hashtag me too gets to put to one side again if you move into what's gone on with um, Black Lives Matter and the rebirthing of what Black Lives Matter, because Black Lives Matter in itself was has been around for quite a few years. And um, there's a few people which were really pushing it um, within the UK as well. But the rekindling of that is, I think, is, is, is significant. It's significant in all different ways. It's significant because it's, it's making people start to think. And it's making people start to think more because, of course, we also have got, we've also been home for six months at a time for COVID. And so where people would have just walked away and not really take much notice of what was going on their TV, they've had to take notice because that's all they've got is the TV or, or having in-depth conversations. And having those in-depth conversations, they're starting to look at the fact of, are they talking about me? Are they, I'm, you know, am I the person they're talking about as a racist? And so I think the conversation is, is going in the right direction. However, we also do very need to be very careful. This country, the United Kingdom is 82% white. Now, you know, when you look at that, 82% white, and the media seems to forget that because I mean, media isn't in many ways our friend because of course they are being bought off in many ways by the, with the government. So they've, they're scared to be as open as they used to be. So why does that make a difference in itself? Well, if 82% of the, the whole of the United Kingdom is white, yet they also make out as though um, it's the other way around, that 82% are people of colour. Um, the, the conversation becomes complicated because unless you understand what's happening, you would think that the people which are really are marginalised in the conversation are the ones which are benefiting. And of course they're not, as Michael, Mark, Malcolm X always says. You have to be careful because the oppressor will make sure that you are the ones which are oppressing. And of course we're not the ones who are oppressing and I think that's important as well. So we all need to also need to be careful about the allies. And when we use the word, oh, I want you to, I want, I want to have uh, allies to support me. There's a very clear difference of having an ally and, and white saviors. Many people are actually white saviors, saviors, and they see being an ally as part of their promotion, part of their promotion in the university or part of their promotion in school. They think it's the right thing to do to get ahead. Well, a few of us are old enough to actually realize that uh, um, we've had enough of white allies who are just using this as a way to step ahead because they, they, they step ahead and we don't get go forward. So really there's an important thing. We need to understand that if you're having people who want to generally help with um, what we're doing, that they really are want, needing to be selfless. They need to be selfless and it's not about them. They need to be able to give us the microphone and the microphone, we can speak for ourselves. And if we need any help with the technical support or whatever it is, we will ask you. But what we don't need you to say is, oh yes. Um, and Victoria is saying this, I don't need you to tell me that. I've got my own PhD, thank you very much. I don't need you to do that. So I think that, I think two more things I just want to say before I come off, I've got 30 seconds, okay. Is about, we've talked about de decolonizing the quick and what happens with that. I think one of the things which does need to happen is what is about assessment and how we assess children in school and how we assess people in the university as well and how that in itself impacts the curriculum, the curriculum and assessment. And the one thing I wanted to just land on before um, I, I completely keep quiet until I answer some questions is why is it that many black children find themselves in the bottom set yet when they look at the exams, they are doing better than the children in the top set. What is that about? They're in the bottom set, yet they're doing better than the children in the top set. I think that's the question, hopefully somebody will want to be answered later on. Okay, thank you very much, um, Venda, and uh, look forward to uh, uh, engaging with some of the questions later. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. Some really, really important points raised there and I, um, I, I also hope that those points will be picked up in the discussion later on as well. It'd be great to hear uh, a bit more on those things. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, we are, um, just to remind you, there is the um, question and answer function. So you can put in, type in your questions there and it will allow the panelists to have a, a think about those things and uh, if we've got enough time, we'll be able to bring on a, a few of those people to ask those questions 
uh, in person as well. And just a reminder to rename yourself if you haven't done so already, so we can call you in um, and identify, identify you by your name. Okay, um, we've got currently um, over 110 people at this workshop, which is uh, fantastic. So I'm looking forward to a really uh, a dynamic discussion later on. Before that, we've got our third speaker, uh, who is Khadija Mohammed. Uh, Khadija is from the Educational Institute of Scotland. Um, and Khadija is also on the STUC Black Workers Committee, um, as well as being a senior lecturer at the University of West Scotland. When you're ready, Khadija. Thank you very much, Brenda, and uh, thank you um, already for the speakers um, who have already spoken. And I just wanted to pick up on that last point, Victoria, that every time I talk about race equality with colleagues, I'm always faced with the question about what about the, the working class white folk? Um, and so I'm always ready and prepared for a response now, because, again, we, we, we constantly sideline the race agenda all the time. Folks, I'll maybe just in my few minutes share with you some of my own thoughts around decolonising the curriculum from a higher education perspective, because I, I teach at university and I'm and share with you a project that I've been leading on recently, which I'm, I'm really excited about. But again, it's important to sustain what we're hoping to achieve. So the need for us to change not only curricula within the university system is, you know, really born from a long standing problem of institutional discrimination. There's absolutely no shortage of evidence of, of um, racial and ethnic inequality within our HE and our FE institutions across the country. There's been a number of student-led movements around the globe who have actively sought, um, uh, you know, acknowledgement of the West collusion and the colonial power relations that then shape our education system. You know, there's roads must fall, um, and why is my curriculum white at UCL and Leeds? Um, but what I've found is that there can often be some confusion around you call it the term decolonizing the curriculum. Many colleagues that I have come across in the last few months have been asking questions, does that mean then that we need to change um, our reading lists within our programmes? Um, so decolonising is far more nuanced than just replacing authors. It is more than just the topics covered in a course. It concerns not only what is taught, but how it is critiqued um, and, 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 and how we teach that. So not to start all over again, but look at the gaps. Whose voices are not being heard? Whose voices are being marginalised? Or actually, from our content, are we reinforcing the negative stereotypes that exist within our current curriculum content? I guess for me, it's really about a paradigm shift and to interrogate how our educational institutions operate. So not just curriculum, it's that whole idea of for, for feeling other words, decolonizing the mind, looking at our governance structures within universities and so on and so forth. But Fundamentally, rethinking the structures of knowledge. Who creates knowledge? Um, and, and how do we know what we know? And what were the power relations within that? And such attitude change requires strong leadership. And for us, it really is around how do we get our leaders, our sector leaders, to, 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 to buy in to what we want to do in terms of um, race equality. I want to share with you very quickly that the European Human Rights Commission published a report in October 2019. In that report, I wasn't surprised, um, as many of you may not be either, they, they reported that racism is common occurrence on our campuses in our universities and colleges across the country. The Scottish Funding Council and Advanced HE set up an expert steering group in response to the recommendations that the EHRC report uh, made. Um, the, the steering group made, was made up of predominantly members from BME backgrounds. It was really, really powerful. We had we have EDI consultants, we have BME students and academics alike sitting around the table having those discussions. And I have the absolute privilege of chairing that steering group um, uh, it, for, for this particular um, recommendation. Our project, folks, base is absolutely based on the premise that. Um, it's racism is pervasive, it's in our society, 
it's in our educational settings, but it's in our every single day experiences. We worked on that premise and I think the success of our group has been because we said, this is a non-negotiable. We've created a space where we're not questioning if racism exists, we are stating that it does, and we are declaring our intention to stand against it. So what we said was, we don't want this to be yet another campaign that withers away after some time, um, particularly with the global pandemic and the killing of George Floyd. We want this to stay. We want critical conversations to lead to critical actions. And we're, we're absolutely delighted to, to, to share with you that in Scotland, certainly, we now have had all 19 of our universities and 26 colleges endorse our declaration. And our declaration was very simple, um, three short sentences. Racism exists on our campuses and in our society. Call it what it is and reject it in all its forms and we stand united against it. But again, we did not want this to be empty words. We want to be able to support our universities because they've now endorsed the declaration. We are now wanting to work and support to see how can we take that work forward. I know we've discussed around this, the, the sort of danger and the balance between allyship and white saviourship. So we're hoping that what we're trying to propose here is a structure, a framework that will support our senior leaders in universities and colleges to take this work forward because it's about working together. It's not about that burden of representation that BME colleagues have to carry or should carry. Um, so we, we're arguing that there's a need for a particular level of racial literacy from our leaders in universities and colleges. And so those who sit at key governance levels, court, senate, senior executive teams, because only then can we begin to engage critical thinking and questioning to move us beyond what often passes as tokenistic gestures. Once that racial literacy is there and understood, then we, then we I actually think have what I would call a perspective advantage, an anti-racist lens to look at current representation on our senior committees, decision-making committees, at our curriculum, at how our learning and teaching perhaps needs to change. Is our pedagogy culturally responsive? And are our professional services staff able to actually better serve the communities of our BME students and our BME staff that, 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 that run in the universities. And so folks, it's really important for us to think about that going forward. Our framework actually um, supports that. So we, first, we are first asking our universities to foster that anti-racist culture of understanding. Um, Thank you. And maybe perhaps embed some training. And it's not just a one-off training or, unconscious bias training, which for me, honestly, is, is for me, it's a get out clause, and it almost reinforces that power relation, the negative stereotypes, but really thinking about that nuanced training that's required to then beginning to think about um, looking into our own, you know, um, house first and get that in order before we think Thank about you. anything. Thank you so much, uh, Khadija. Such really, really powerful, important points uh, made there. Um, and, and I think it's really, you know, significant that you have said, you know, empty words and empty, you know, actions yeah. are just no longer post um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. It's just not good enough at all. And uh, I really um, think it's really important. We do recognise this is um, has to go to such a deeper level, like you say, decolonizing the mind is really something that we need to be thinking about and um, the kind of actions that requires as well. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution, Khadija. Uh, and you can, if you, uh, if you want to ask Khadija any questions, then please uh, make sure you uh, put the questions in the Q&A um, function and we will be able to call you on when we have the discussion part of the meeting. Okay, we're gonna move on to our uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is Anna Rothery, um, the Liverpool Lord Mayor. Anna, um, please make a start when you're ready. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me today. I just want to talk about the language and as uh, Sister Khadija just mentioned around some of the, the language that's being used like unbiased, uh, unconscious bias, um, imposter syndrome, underachievement, underattainment, all of this language, you know, uh, uh, goes a long way to, to 
keeping us as black people within within that same position. And so looking at how we move forward, we recognize uh, what's happened historically, but we're not the sum total of enslavement. We are much, much more than that. So we need to be focusing on economic equality, about what is our position in terms of education, employment, uh, business, uh, etc. And so and also, what are we doing in terms of moving our agenda forward? And I say our agenda forward because with all of the allies that you may have and, uh, and, and, and people have, have stated previously that sometimes this is utilized by people who want to sort of hijack uh, our cause and our, and our fight. And so how do we move it forward in terms of making spaces within uh, you know, academia, within our uh, educational systems, within our workplace and within our businesses for people to come forward? And so that's something that I'm really committed to in terms of looking at how we move forward in Liverpool, but uh, nationally and sharing good practice, working with uh, Bristol City Council, um, Marvin Rees and uh, his deputy, Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Asher Craig, in terms of what we can do. We've got a very similar demographic, uh, same history in terms of both being port cities and the impact that that had on us uh, historically and how it killed still impacts on us going forward and so looking at what we can actually do and I'm very much about solution based it's great to have conversations but we mustn't lose sight of what we need to do we have a very small window of opportunity in order to make some mammoth changes in terms of how we are uh, uh, positioned and, and how we are perceived uh, by the wider society. So looking at working with our educators, looking at working with our businesses, talking to them, having the very difficult conversations uh, that we need to have in order to um, make those massive changes and also holding them to account. Um, I'm, I'm about to do an event uh, on the 29th of this month called uh, Step Up, Step Forward, which is working with our businesses and our educators across the city and asking them to pledge, you know, what are they actually going to do to make a difference going forward? Um, I've had the um, pleasure of working with Hope University and we've put together two programmes, a Black Social Workers programme and a Black Teachers programme. We recognise that there are lack, uh, there is a lack of black teachers and black social workers, and we also recognise that without people in these pivotal positions, then how can we have our youth looking towards strong black role models and looking at their aspirations and where they fit within society? So that's something that needs to be remedied very, very quickly. Um, in terms of looking at employment opportunities, you know, I gave up arguing the moral case many, many years ago when people's eyes started to glaze over at the mere conversation around equality. And so now looking at a very robust business model for why black people should be part and parcel, front and centre of our corporations, our businesses, and also in terms of being a strong customer base that has just been demonstrated with the Black Pound Day when we looked at how much money goes into the local and national econ economy from black people. So really looking at uh, how we bring about that change uh, and how we do it in a constructive and accountable manner so that we can hold people to account and hold them to task and measure the impact. We all know that we are not underachievers. We are people who have an aptitude to overachieve given the right set of circumstances and environment. And now we need to be able to prove that and show that and have the opportunity in order to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, um, for you know um, raising the importance of um, representation, but also you know helping us um, understand that leadership on these things is absolutely crucial for us to kind of see things happen happening in practice as well. So thank you so much, um, Anna. Um, Please continue to submit your questions. The panelists can um, see the questions and so they can um, have a think about that so we can have a more structured discussion. Okay, I'm going to call our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is uh, Nadia Sayyid. Uh, Nadia is part of the Student Stand Up to Racism. Nadia, you have um, six minutes when you're ready. Thank you. 
<clears throat> thanks for that, um, Benda, um, and a big thanks to all of our speakers who I think have uh, set out a really brilliant introduction to what is, I think, a really important um, discussion at this point. And I suppose I sort of wanted to sort of go back to what things would be like a year ago, because this time last year, you know, there'd be hundreds of us packing into a friends meeting house in Houston, rushing into different meetings and workshops like this. Um, but obviously, you know, within a short space of time, things have dramatically changed. And obviously the pandemic is a big part of that. Um, but I don't think the only part of that really um, and I think, you know, um, Daniel was right to start with this at the very beginning, but I wanted to emphasise this point. But I think, you know, what we saw in particular over the summer, um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement was how actually it had radically, you know, changed the terrain um, when it comes to actually uh, the question of fighting racism. Um, and you can see that in particular um, when it comes to the fight to decolonise now, um, you know, campaigns that have existed for years um, suddenly found themselves with a whole new audience, a whole new uh, set of activists, you know, ready to to actually fight and so on. And I think, you know, one of the you know best examples we can see of that was the Roads Must Fall campaign um, in Oxford. You know, it, uh, begun in 2015, following a uh, suit of the students in the University of Cape Town with their Roads Must Fall campaign. Um, and in Oxford in 2015, you know, the Roads Must Fall campaign was a largely you know student campaign that could mobilise a few hundred students and lecturers. Um, you know, to uh, rally demands against the university to remove uh, the statue and so on. What you saw with Black Lives Matter was actually how it had transformed Rose Must Fall into a much bigger movement that put thousands of people outside of Oriel College, but not just from the university, but at, crucially from the local area as well. Um, and if you watched or took part in any of the rallies, you know, they were demanding far more than the removal of the statue of the arch imperialist Cecil Rhodes. You know, they were demanding the decolonization of the syllabus, the admission of more black uh, staff and students, um, and more than that, taking on the institutional racism within the institution uh, uh, faced by uh, staff and students uh, in the university as well. Um, and I think really, you know, going back to the bigger picture, you know, what we've seen is how much Black Lives Matter has really brought into the mainstream um, and made it more mainstream to challenge, you know, and, and question the legacy of colonialism um, and empire by exposing the link that they have with the entrenched racism we see and experience in society today, you know, whether that's the institutional racism in education or employment um, or the institutional racism that murdered George Floyd um, on the 25th of um, May and you know it's about so much more um, than the statues and anyone who thinks that um, obviously haven't taken part um, in the marches and actions that are taken part uh, up and down the country um, over that summer because for a whole generation of people you know radicalized by a whole number of issues in society you know racism is the key fault line in that society um, and the statues and the symbols that celebrate colonialists and slave traders um, are only a small part of the discussion really um, and not really the totality at all um, the reality is, is that people are just sick to death um, of an education that's not just racist in what they uh, teach us, um, but racist in how they can treat us as well, whether it's the issues around exclusion rates, the black attainment gap, um, or what have you. Um, lots of things as well that our uh, fantastic uh, speakers have highlighted too. Um, but more than that, I think people have had enough um, of the racist society that our education system functions in. Um, and that's what I think made Black Lives Matter so radical um, this summer. Um, as Victoria said, Black Lives Matter didn't just uh, exist this summer. Black Lives Matter has been around for a long time. But there was something uh, that uh, was particularly radical about uh, and bigger about Black Lives Matter um, this time around. And I think all of those things have fed into that. Um, now, I think obviously the movement doesn't really exist on the same scale that it had. But like I said, I think it's radically changed the terrain um, when it comes to fighting racism and has radicalized a whole generation of people. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, just thinking about the impact it's had, you know, I remember going on completely unrelated some of the uh, demonstrations after the school students uh, exam results fiasco and you know when you talk to uh, any of those students or heard uh, some of the this is the a-level results fiasco um, or heard uh, any of the speeches and rallies outside of the department of education so many people mentioned how actually uh, black lives matter was a movement that they'd taken part in um you know been been inspired by um and so on and i think really you know 
actually our job is uh, to draw you know that anger and radicalization in society um, into a mass movement that can actually win fundamental changes um, in the fight against racism and I think you know a big uh, thing that's important to that is getting organized um, you know whether that's in our schools uh, or campuses or in our workplaces um, we've had some of the you know excellent work that's been happening um, in the National Education Union, in the uh, University and Colleges Union, the Education Institute of Scotland. Um, you know, if you're a student, I suppose this is what I can weigh in, if you're a student um, at a university or a college, you know, can you organise a decolonise meeting for Black History Month? We've got one more week left. You know, can you raise demands um, on your schools uh, or universities management about improving their curriculum or, or the course or what have you? You know, so many universities and institutions seen the warning um, thing so many universities and institutions were very keen as uh, speakers have pointed out to say that they're pro black lives matter or you know aware or or have you know anti racism or have you some uh, what in their ethos or what or whatever you know let's hold them to that um let's hold them to all the things that they'd said when Black Lives Matter was something big and trending and, and what have you. Um, but more than that, I think, you know, whatever we're doing to decolonize education, it has to be linked to a wider struggle against racism in society. You know, Boris Johnson and the Tories have headed us towards, you know, a second wave of the pandemic. And for what, you know, forcing business as usual and putting profit before people hasn't done anything to stop you know the economic uh, crisis that we're driving towards anyway um, and we're already beginning to see uh, you know mass unemployment um, and that's going to continue with more people losing their jobs um, their homes and so on and we know that racism will put black people on the sharp end of that crisis both the economic um, and the pandemic but more than that, um, as had uh, been mentioned uh, uh, earlier as well, you know, Johnson and the Tories response to that will be to deflect the anger in society away from themselves who are really to blame um, by ramping up the races and finding scapegoats um, and so on. Um, and, you know, it's the same people who don't want to confront, um, as Daniel would put it, you know, their racist and colonial past who are in no way prepared to change or confront the racism of their present. Um, and that's why we have to build, you know, a mass anti-racist movement that actually unites people and takes all of that on. Um, and if you agree with that project, then I think, you know, you need to, we want you to join Stand Up to Racism um, and be part of that fight back that fuses, you know, the energy and vitality that we saw with Black Lives Matter with the wider anger against racism and inequality in society. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you for uh, tying all of that up with some suggestions about actions we can take to come together as a uh, group of people, it's a group of very big people, really, to enact uh, really important and meaningful changes as well. Thank you very much, Nadia. Okay, we're going to move on to the uh, discussion uh, part of the meeting. Um, and I'm going to call on um, three of the attendees to um, be moved to panelists so they can ask their questions and the panelists will have a chance to respond. I will warn the, uh, the attendees, um, you will have three minutes to make your contributions. And after the three minutes, you will be automatically cut off. And this is just to ensure that we get as many contributions from the floor as possible. So I do apologize in advance and ask that you keep your questions and contributions as uh, concise as possible. Ask, um, um, we're going to have contributions from Pauline Rutter, Caroline Riley, and Sasha Simic. First. Hello. Did you did you want me to ask some questions first? Is that okay? Yes, please, Pauline. Great. Thank you. So um, I was thinking about uh, what Victoria was saying uh, initially. Uh, in, in the discussion, in, in the presentation, and uh, asking about what networks uh, can educationists and anti-racists use uh, or, or, or join to help withstand the pushback against taking control of the curriculum. And one of the things I'm thinking about, even organizations like um, the higher education uh, um, organizations that stand against uh, racism, that 
sometimes they feel quite exclusive in themselves and uh, the way that people can become involved or become connected to them feels uh, quite difficult, especially because within higher education, and that's my area as, a, as an associate researcher, uh, but also as a qualified teacher, that um, when your time is very pressured, when your uh, students of color are more likely to seek you out as someone to support them, when your, uh, your colleagues are not always as supportive as they think they are being, and when perhaps your senior management doesn't have a lot of time to support, whether it's your research areas that may have some race element to them, or whether it's in stuff you're writing for uh, a decolonizing curriculum um, journal within the university, which is very much trying to address what's going on within schools and, and the activities that teachers are trying to take proactively. So uh, that idea about what networks exist and, and do they exist and are they, are they really available uh, and promoted 